Call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. This is a Prescott City Council workshop. Uh, let's please call roll. Mayor Mangarelli? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Orr? Here. Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Good? Here. Councilmember Rusing? Here. Councilwoman Scholl? Here. And Councilman Sishka? Here. All are present. All right. Thank you for that. Let me give just a, a little brief uh, agenda rundown, Bryn, before we get going here. So we're going to, uh, for, for the sake of those here and uh, those listening online, we're going to go through a uh, presentation. Um, you're going to do the 60-day public comment first summary, and then after that, we'll do a presentation regarding the uh why do I not see it here? Anyway, the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, then after we do that, uh, we can do a little bit of uh, council discussion in regard to those two items. And then we'll go to public comment. We hope to have at least an hour for public comment uh, for those that are watching online as well as those that are here in the room. Uh, we'll do two minutes per person to get as many people through as we can. Uh, and then I think that should do it. Uh, for our agenda today. So, Bryn. Wonderful. Thank you, and good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, welcome to another step in the process of the review of the AED annexation proposals. This is an important step that's underpinned by a very specific uh, legal, uh, legal process, a proposition that was passed back in 2005 by the voters of our region, and it specifically addresses the annexation, annex, an annexation proposal of 250 acres or more. This is right out of the charter. We're not going to read through this, but I wanted to be certain to um, just reference that this Prop 400 language does appear directly in our charter. It guides this process. It affirms the requirements, and it was added to the city charter in November of 2005. So just to recap, the city charter um, and Prop 400 as a part of that requires for any annexation of 250 acres or more that a 60-day public review and comment period is held before the city council takes any action. That 60-day public review and comment period uh, commences upon the Planning and Zoning Commission making recommendations to the council. So as of the date of that action, which was September 15th, um, our 60-day comment period initiated. The Prop 400 requirements include a presentation um, or synopsis of all public comments that are made to council. We won't be reading them individually. We'll be providing you with an analysis, a topical analysis that lets you know the percentage of comments that were made topic by topic so you'll understand um, what most of the comments pertain to and um, we'll also identify folks that made comments on more than one topic, individual users, in other words, some folks made more than one comment during the comment period, so we break it down by that as well. But in addition, the, uh, the Prop 400 and it, as a part of the charter requires a three quarters vote by the city council, which is six out of seven votes to approve an annexation of 250 acres or more. In addition, all effluent from annexed areas must go towards permanent recharge of the aquifer. That was a, an important provision included in the proposition. What we're addressing today are the comments that were received between September 15th and November 14th. There were a total of 192 written comments uh, received during that period. All have been forwarded to council individually. We've batched them on a week by week basis so that you guys could consume them and not have a, uh, an onslaught of comments to read in anticipation of this meeting. So hopefully that was helpful. So we're gonna uh, present a presentation of the public comments and a little bit of analysis and, and a statistical look at how those comments came in, what they pertain to. Yes. May, may or may I make a, a real quick comment about the comment period? Despite the misinformation that's out there, public comments on this project or any project like this can continue to come in, can the public hearings will continue, um, public comments will still be accepted and still be considered and looked at by the council and by staff as this thing goes forward. So this sort of notion, and I wanna disabuse people of this right away, the notion that somehow this 60 day comment period ending is the end of public participation is just nonsense. 
Thank you, John. That's a very important point. So with regard to the annexation itself, under ARS 9-471, which is the annexation statute, we have a number of remaining steps left after today's meeting. This is just the beginning of the council's look at this project, the two proposals specifically. Under the annexation statute, council must hold a public hearing at a future date in compliance with the annexation statute. Following that public hearing, council may choose to act on the annexations on that date if they choose, and the related requests, or they may defer and request more information. You all can have as many meetings as you choose to uh, prior to voting. Should the annexation and rezoning actions that were recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission be approved or modified by council, they will become effective 30 days following that approval. And again, that's a six out of seven council member vote approval. So before we got into, get into the comments specifically, we wanted to provide a light overview of the two annexation proposals. This map uh, shows you the acreage outline and the relationship to that blue boundary, which is the city limits of Prescott. Both north and south are depicted here, and of course we've got Highway 89A running in between the two. This is a total of, <coughs> to my acreage sheet. <coughs> didn't put it in here, 20, I believe 2,422 acres total, um, eight, one second, 1621 for the north annexation proposal, and 801 in acreage for the south annexation. We'll take them one at a time just for the, to be more concise. The south annexation sits south of Route 89A and east of State Route 89. You'll see the, the small circle to sitting to the west of the main annexation area. Those two um, pieces of property are in the county, but are a part of the master plan. They're, they're not um, proposed for the annexation itself, but they do play a part in the overall approval, review and approval of the master plan. Roadway access to AED South comes via 89A off of the Granite Dells Parkway interchange. Uh, there's a southbound route that turns into Granite Dells Ranch Parkway. Gran sorry, Granite Dells Ranch Road, pardon me. To the west is the Fippin Roundabout, which isn't depicted on the map, um, but it actually will be connected with Granite Dells Ranch Road at some future date. The future co crossing of Granite Creek has been on the horizon and contemplated by the city of Prescott for a number of years. Um, those folks that have been purchasing homes in Granite Dells Estates and Walden Farms, their impact fees have been contributing to a fund to make the improvement of the future crossing of Granite Creek. I believe that this is a civil, civil improvement project in public works next three years, three to five years of planning. Um, Mr. Giese has indicated that he would need that crossing to be in play by 2023 in order to be effective and, and provide access to the subdivision from that side. Here's the South Master Plan. This is the master plan that was reviewed by Planning and Zoning Commission and recommended for approval. As you can see, uh, sections K and L represent the, the proposed eco-resort. The natural open space all falls south of that and slightly to the west. And then the areas in the, what I like to call the chimney of the south annexation, the light uh, beige color would be single family housing uh, based on SF6 zoning. That means a minimum of 6,000 square foot lots. And sections A, B, and C will be are slated for multifamily housing. That's about 80 acres slated for multifamily housing at the very north end of the development. Let's touch on the north annexation. You can see that the relationship of the north annexation um, is very much, the airport is very much in play. In fact, the area at the end of our runway to the north and east um, encompasses about 400 acres of additional property that the city will receive if we complete uh, the annexation process for these two proposals. There's uh, approximately, I think, 100 and, no, I won't go into the acreage, but there's about 400 acres at the end of the runway, which will be a tremendous help to the growth of the airport and provide stability for the future runway expansion. 
And again, Granite Dells Parkway Interchange, which is pointed out on the map, will provide northbound access from Highway 89A. This is the North Master Plan. The housing component is to the south and east. Um, currently, based on information received from Arizona Eco Development, they're planning for plus or minus 775 manufactured home units that would be in a rental village community where folks would actually rent the slabs but provide their own manufactured home. The balance of the housing in that area, plus or minus 775 homes, will be single family residences that will be for uh, fee simple title sale. You can see the purple area being the airport impact zone at the end of the runway. The natural open space running north and south basically follows um, the wash and the Peavine Trail uh, connection is through that area. And then there are the dark purple parcels are industrial uh, general and the medium purple parcel is industrial transition. The blue parcel at the very bottom is designated for municipal uses. So schools, um, fire stations, police substations, we, we sort of ruled out that in this scenario, police or fire would choose to locate there, but we would anticipate potentially a charter school going in that um, blue area. At this point, um, we're gonna get into the comments analysis. Are there any questions from council at this time on any of the overview presented at, at this point? Questions, comments from council? I had a question, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. John, when you talked about public comment in the 60-day period, was that meant to comment on the development agreement solely? Actually, <laughs> the way the charter reads, it, it, the comments are on the annexation and master plan. Uh, there's no reference to the term development agreement or zoning um, in the in the charter. So my view is is that the comment period is intended to the 60 day comment period is intended to comment on sort of the big issue, the big picture issues, which is which the the charter, the initiative uh, from the initiative, you can sort of infer that the big issues of concern were the annexation itself and this master plan. Um, and so that's what the comment period is intended for. Again, I reiterate that the, the remainder of the issues, whether there are subdivision plats, whether the actual zoning, um, and the mass plan kind of contemplates zoning, whether it's a PAD, development agreements, there's, there's ample time through this process for additional public comment. The 60-day comment period, it's, it, I, I think it, misinforms people that that's the only time they can comment, and it's certainly not. There, there were comments before the 60-day period to the Planning Commission, and there'll be comments post-60-day period. Um, let me also make one other point on the master plan, this term master plan. The City Land Development Code has a master plan concept, and, and it deals with um, a certain type of zoning. Um, I forget what it's called. When we use master plan, land area development, land area developments Maybe. have math. That master plan is a sp is a defined term that the land development code uses. It's not the same as what the charter impo implies or requires. The charter requires sort of this two dimensional master plan when it comes to the annexation, which is what you've seen in this application for annexation. It's essentially a single page, or in this case, two pages because two annexations that basically give you a broad overview of what the uses are and perhaps the densities. So there's a real distinction between what our land development code describes as a master plan and what the charter, when, they t when the term is used master plan without any definition, what that means. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Roosing. Thank you. I have a question for Bryn. I noticed that uh, the amount of manufactured homes on the north parcel are now 775 instead of 1550. The total uh, number of housing units for the, that area in the north annexation was slated for 1550. They're dividing that between manufactured homes uh, that are designed in a rental village type concept and single family residences that will be for sale for fee simple title. So it'll still be 1550? It will be. Um, keep in mind that as part of the letter of intent and um, some of the deal was predicated on the fact that if um, AED wanted to move density northbound, that's the area that they would move it to from the south annexation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think you're good. 
All right, so just to let you know, when we come back for future meetings, we'll take a much deeper dive into the land use concepts found within the master plan for both north and south. Um, and we'll be looking at a, just taking a more detailed look at both annexation proposals. But we wanted to give you sort of the high level uh, overview for today so that we can get right to the public comments. So now I'm going to turn it over to Planning Manager George Worley. He's going to uh, explain to you what people are talking about with regard to these proposals. Thank you. So what's on the screen right now is a screenshot of one page of a spreadsheet that we use to track all of the comments and keep them in uh, relatively um, common categories. So those are the comments. I think my presentation is done. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Um, we are going to go into a little bit more detail with some of the topics because a lot of them had a lot of comments. I um, want to point out that most of the commentors, when they submitted either by email or letter to us, hit more than one topic in their comments. So don't add the numbers up in these tables. They won't add up. Uh, 192 individual unique comments came to us. Within those, um, many of them addressed open space, archaeology. And again, we're not going to go through every single one, but we're going to hit most of the highlights in this. Uh, open space, quantity, and quality were, were probably the number one of all the comments we received. Most of them address the acreage requirements that are, were either perceived as required under the original uh, Save the Dells proposal of 500 acres or the perceived uh, difference between the LOI number of 475 and um, a, a perception right now that 11 acres should be discounted from that. And I'll address that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, most of those comments uh, simply pressed for holding your ground, standing in for 475 total acres to be deeded to the city. We had a lot of comments about the archaeological sites and a desire to include those within the open space to further protect them. So the archaeological site, there's one in particular that's attracted a lot of public attention. That one is in the very south end of the south annexation, and it is at or adjacent to the border of the developable single-family area and the natural open space area to be deeded to the city. So a lot of comments relating to that. We had a lot of comments, and most of them came in the second half of the 60-day period, wanting the development agreement um, available for public comment during this period. Um, John has done um, a, a very good job of explaining that the development agreement was not a requirement of Proposition 400, and it, it will continue through the process. And we'll talk a little bit more about a couple of other issues that came out of these that um, appear to be in misinformation or a lack of information to the public, and we want to correct that so that everyone understands the whole process. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and definitely, if you have a question, please ask. George, can you have something, a hard copy of something you can give us? We have been providing you copies of all of these, but I can get you a copy this of This analysis. The, I can give you a copy of this as a hard copy. I would yes, appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, protection of Wildlife Corridor, um, within the uh, open space area in the south annexation was a, 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 had a lot of comments. Don't build houses too close to the creek. Uh, the no-name creek that runs through is a wildlife corridor. It's known to carry a lot of wildlife activity. Uh, so a lot of the comments were related to keeping the development away from that. Water resources were generally, uh, don't expend city water resources on more development. Um, most of these were um, uh, generally considered would be generally considered a, an outright opposition to the annexation a, altogether. Peavine Trail aesthetics, this is category is more of the view from the trail. So don't put the houses too close, put buffer areas along the trail to provide some, some um, buffer between the, the impacts of development and the um, uh, enjoyment of trail users. Master plan insufficiencies. These were more focused on the resort area rather than the overall master plan. So most of these comments included some comment about the resort area and the associated zoning, which is a little further down, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. 
a lot of questions or concerns about housing character. So the housing character was mostly focused on the development in the north end of the south annexation, the area that will fall between Granite Creek and um, Granite Dells Estates, the, the, that area that's in between Walden Ranch and Granite Dells Estates. So we're concerned about small lot dense development, which is kind of interesting because both of them are small lot and dense development. But there was an objection to more of that development occurring in between. We, we don't know how that will actually lay out on the ground when subdivision platting starts, if the annexation were to proceed. When subdivision planning uh, begins, we will, from a staff perspective, as we do with most developments, suggest the planned area development approach to provide extra open space and allow clustering of development rather than a simple blanket subdivision. And um, some of that character question may go away as a result of that. A lot of comments, mostly from the area of Granite Dells Estates, on traffic impacts. Um, it, it's very evident, looking at the maps that Bryn showed you a few moments ago, that the initial access to all of the development in the south will be through Granite Dells Estates. Um, the roadway was designed that way. It was planned from the moment that Aunt Granite Dells Estates was annexed to provide access to this area or other areas for future annexation. The roadways are designed to handle the traffic, but it will be an increase in traffic in those areas, and there is some concern expressed about that. So, George, can I ask a question? Certainly. So, on that one where it talks about character of housing. Housing character, yes. I mean, those are pretty nice houses. They are. They're farms on small and lots and estates. So you're thinking that these comments were more that we want something like Hasiyampa or... I, I think the intent was less density and, and larger lot, perhaps. Um, some of the comments were specific to that, and you'll see, I, as Brent noted, we've been sending them to you. Right. So every single comment we get in relation right. to this is going to council for your consideration. Um, Many of those comments were more focused on don't put the same kind of development that we see in Granite Dells Estates adjacent to Granite Dells Estates. Um, I don't know whether that's logical or not logical. Um, most people desire to see larger lot sizes adjacent to their properties, whatever the size of their property is. So that's something we see persi consistently, persistently through most public processes relating to zoning and subdivision planning. Everyone wants larger lots next to them, not the same size lots. <laughs> so I think that's probably what this is more focused on. Thank you. There were a, a number of comments relating to trail buffering. So this is the opposite of the trail aesthetic. So instead of the view from the trail, the, this is an effort to keep houses away from the trail for the protection of the property owners of those houses. So it's, it works in conjunction and the two overlap to a significant degree. If you buffer the trail, you buffer the adjacent development from the trail. So you're buffering the trail from development and development from the trail. Crossing the Peavine, we had 26 very specific comments. No at-grade crossing was the predominant one. Um, actually, it's a lesser number specifically than we anticipated because that has been a very hot topic and a very big concern. And I know councils express some um, desire to see uh, specific types of crossings be explored. Uh, there was a number of comments regarding the 11 acres in the county, and this relates back to the um, previous page where we talked about the number of comments on general open space in the area. Uh, there is a, a persistent um, information out there that the 11 acres that are to remain in the county are somehow not protected as open space, even though they will be designated as open space on the master plan, which can include county lands and they will be deeded to the city as part of that 475 acres uh, agreed to in the LOI, and presumably that will end up in the development agreement. So those 11 acres are in fact protected open space and maybe usable open space, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. There was concern about the multifamily zoning at the very north end of the south annexation. Because it is adjacent to Granite Dells Estates on one side and across the creek, Walden Ranch on the other, there was some concern about it not being compatible. 
one thing that I think needs to be uh, remembered, though, is it is also immediately adjacent to industrial property to the north. And typically, multifamily zoning and multifamily developments, because of their ability to be flexible on buffering and parking lots and space arrangements, are considered good buffering between industrial or commercial development and residential development further south. So it made a lot of sense for um, the AED folks to propose a higher density multifamily even immediately adjacent to the uh, industrial uh, development to the north. There were comments relating to the resort and the SPC zoning, uh, believing SPC is not the best zoning or that it's outright incorrect because it doesn't allow a hotel use. I do have a couple of extra slides in here to address a few of these topics. So. Uh, I think I can answer the concerns about those. Uh, there were comments about the park development and how intense of a park it would be. Is it a parking lot and interpretive center? Is it a park with playgrounds? There were a, a wide gamut of comments about that. And, and as you read through those, you'll note that some are in favor of a heavier intensity use, more of a park setting, and others are probably the majority are more in favor of just an interpretive center and then access into a trail system. And then we had a, a number of questions about Proposition 400 specifically, which in fact is now the charter, um, not following the steps along that way, and it's almost all tied back to the development agreement not being available for review during that 60-day period. So again, it's, it's something that I think uh, the city attorney has addressed. We did a tally of the, the overall number of comments. So again, we received 192 unique comments. Of those, um, 169 of them were clearly opposed to some fashion or portion of, almost none of them were opposed to the whole annexation, but they were opposed to something. They, didn't, they were opposed to the SPC zoning, they were opposed to the area of open space, they, there was something that was opposed to the presentation currently before council, the proposal currently before council. Um, we had one who was absolutely flat out in favor of it, and that was not Jason Giese, I will tell you. <laughs> I did check. Um, comments not clearly supporting one way or the other were, uh, we had some that were just expressed concerns. Um, we, we had one that um, I, I'm sure came from a sailor just based on the language that was included. In. Um, I, I think we did forward that one to you for your enjoyment. Um, total of 192. Fairly significant uh, comments within a 60 day period. Um, we were pleased to see that many people comment to us. I have a question, George. Certainly. <clears throat> Were you able to um, differentiate between the comments that were focused on the north annexation versus the south annexation? It appears to me that most of the comments that you reviewed here were really focused on the south annexation. We didn't separate them out, but I can tell you from reading through all of them, because everything you've seen I've read, 99% right. um, of them were focused on the south. Um, they were almost all relating to uh, impacts on the existing developments down there or potential impacts on the open space or the type of development that would occur at the resort. A couple of things came out, in fact, I've listed four. Four things came out especially, and I, and I apologize, I, in reading these, it, it's obvious that a planner made this list because these are all planning related stuff. Um, there, there's some common misinformation out there. John's talked on a little bit of it, and, and I'm gonna hit it because I'm not gonna let him steal my thunder. Um, but these things are important. The public needs to understand that some of the information that they're reading might not be accurate or fully accurate, and we wanna correct those things when we can. Um, the city attorney's talked pretty thoroughly about 60-day period. There's absolutely nothing in the charter that limits public comment before it or after it. This is a set period of time to guarantee public comment on the annexation itself. It's not intended to limit public comment. Um, I don't anticipate there's anything um, either um, any of the comments prior being ignored or any comments that you subsequently get being ignored. There's a lot of information out there that the SPC is the incorrect zoning for the resort. Many of the comments that we've heard or seen or read mention this. Um, 
partially by misreading of the land development code, I think, some misinformation has gotten out. Hotels which are specific to the use that's proposed, a hotel resort in that area, are not listed as a permitted use in the SPC zoning district if you look at the land use table. Nothing is listed in the land use table for SPC district. There are no permitted underlying by right uses. All of them require that you adopt a master plan that specifies the uses and then that zoning district with the weight of zoning law only allows those uses you include in the master plan. It's the, it's not the correct or incorrect, is the only zoning category that would work for what has been proposed in the LOI and presumably will end up in the development agreement to limit that use to only a hotel resort. So it's, it is the only available and correct zoning category for that. So nothing is listed in the table for any other use, just to be clear about that, because that's um, an easily correctable uh, situation. Anyone reading the land use table would see that. The 11 acres um, outside the annexation but within the master plan, um, this one holds some special meaning to me because I am widely quoted in letters as having used the phrase open spacey in describing this at, at Planning Commission. I denied it until I listened to myself say it on the recording. Uh, <laughs> So open spacey came out of my mouth while I was trying to describe in general various uses throughout the whole master plan area. The 11 acres is proposed to be part of the 475 um, open space acres in the master plan designated to be uh, donated to the city, deeded to the city as part of that agreement that's specified in the LOI. That particular area is separated from the main annexation area by two streets, uh, both county roads um, and the city of Prescott's 89. So there's a county road that separates two pieces and then there's 89 which is within the corporate limits that separates those two, the one piece from the other piece. And I'll show you a map in just a moment. One thing that I think has been um, missed is that while it's 11 acres over there, there's also another six city acres that we already own immediately adjacent to them and it's obvious when you look at the map. So the, the area that are identified as AED, not highlighted in red AED as part of the proposed annexation, highlighted in red AED separated by the curved road is the county area and then across 89 is another county area because both of those areas adjoin the right of way of 89 which is in the city of Prescott, they could be annexed by us at any point in the future. The same with the two City of Prescott parcels south of there. I've been in touch with our Parks and Recreation Department. They have been negotiating with the property owner to the west of those parcels for years on uh, potential for trails easements to make connectivity westward. And eventually if you travel far enough westward, you end up with the trail <coughs> system behind the Whispering Rock development. If you remember how important that was as part of its annexation, they provided open space and they provided trail connectivity over there. This is the other side of that and would connect straight through. There's also a perception in the public that this is a pile of rocks and it's useless. I can tell you parts of it are a pile of rocks and they're useless for active recreation unless you like rock climbing or scrambling. So the, the curved piece in the middle, probably not really usable for anything active, but again it's open space and it's protected natural open space. On the other side of the road, very accessible, potentially a trailhead there someday is uh, certainly a possibility. And in fact, that's what it looks like from the road. Um, the, the high rocks, the rocks very close to the road are further south and on the opposite side of the street on the east side of, of 89. So again, this one is one that, um, in fact, it is usable open space and should be protected. So yes, George, what was that acreage again of the city of Prescott property below? It's six acres that we own in two parcels right now. Okay. And then 11 right. acres of this would be um, immediately adjacent to it or near it. Thank you. There's also a lot of information about the archeological site and the only way that the known archeological site, um, I think we 
mentioned at some point that um, with the archaeological study that was done by previous owners before AED, there were multiple archaeological sites throughout the area, just as there were in Granite Dells Estates, and just as there were in Walden Ranch, and just as there were in most other developments in the north half of Prescott. The archaeological site is not within the open space boundaries that are shown on the proposed uh, master plan. They're in an area that could be developed. It's within an area shown as single family development. The parcels were studied. There, there is an existing master plan, uh, or uh, excuse me, archaeological study and mitigation plan on, on the books for that property. It has to be followed. It is subject to uh, federal and state laws as well as our own requirements for that process. The preferred mitigation is avoidance. It always is avoidance with any archaeological sites. And one way to a attain that avoidance is through planned area development development style. So we are looking at the potential for negotiating with um, um, PADs as we call them. And that's one of the ways that an avoidance could occur. Subject to that not working, there are requirements in the mitigation plan that they're going to have to follow regardless. George, I had Certainly. a question about the archaeological site. Uh, have we had any correspondence or interest shown by the local tribe in and about this site? Have they reached out to us in the public comment period or at any other time? Not that I'm aware of. Expressing no. concerns about this? No, sir. Generally, the way it works is if if a site is studied and there's obvious information that might lead to the belief that there are human remains on the site, the tribe gets involved. If there aren't obvious results that show that, then as the development occurs and more specific mitigation is done, if that, again, human remains are discovered, the tribe is brought in immediately. So it's usually us reaching out to them, not the other way around. As a courtesy, could we at some point do that? Certainly. And have the conversation with them to find out if there's anything specific that they may have a concern about, or is this a site that's on their radar that they want to see something specific done? We can certainly do that. When archaeological studies and mitigation plans are developed, normally the um, the consultant who's hired to do that will reach out to tribes um, if there's known connectivity for a particular area. So I would be surprised if they haven't reached out to the tribe at the time they did this, but that's been a number of years ago, so certainly we can refresh that con connection. And that's basically the end of our presentation. Again, I want to emphasize the public comment period is still open. Um, this is the statutory requirement by charter, but it doesn't cut off public comment. And every comment we get, we are forwarding to you so you will have them. Um, members of the public can be assured that if you send an email, it's landing in council's hands. Yeah, it's well stated, George, that this was just a guaranteed uh, public comment. It's not, you know, we, we had hundreds of comments before the 60-day public comment period, and I'm sure we will continue to have people <laughs> emailing us, and we will be looking at those emails. So good presentation. It's, uh, it's helpful to see it kind of categorized, if you will. Uh, any other questions for George or Bryn here? Oh, Can I just yeah, make John. a, a follow-up question or follow-up point? The, the 475, <clears throat> that 11 acres, just, just so it's absolutely clear that the letter of intent, 475, included that 11 acre, those 11 acres. So that's always been 475. So this misconception that it's really only 463 is just, again, a, a misrepresentation. I think the other thing, George, could you address, when it comes to archaeological studies, there's a very limited disclosure as to who, who can get that. Very. So you, would you address that? Can you address um, that? By, by state and federal law, both, the, the archaeological study, identifying the location of, of any archaeological sites, especially any that may involve habitation, are very limited. It takes a special process to make them public. Um, generally speaking, the only time you see that is when it's public property. So you can visit ruins on um, public property because they've been mitigated already and those rooms have been preserved. Generally speaking, on private property, that's not the case. Um, we get an archaeological study when a developer does one. It goes to our 
uh, historic preservation person, uh, Kat Moody, most of you know or have dealt with her. She is the only person within the city's staff that generally gets a look at it. Um, I can see just bits and pieces of them in relation to subdivision layout. They are not public knowledge. They should not be public knowledge. That's part of the Antiquities Act to protect those sites from the public taking, um, um, perhaps taking things from those sites or damaging those sites. So hopefully that answered it. Anything else from the council at this point before we go to cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, I'm here. yeah, go ahead. Well, it's pretty clear to me, um, and I've been advocating for the separation of these two annexations for quite a long time. Uh, clearly, the public comments are, as you mentioned, almost exclusively focused on the southern annexation. Um, but the northern annexation has uh, many different aspects to it. Um, the friendly um, condemnation of the um, land at the end of the runway, so the airport expansion um, and cap capacity can be increased in the future. The ability to be able to protect the airport-specific area plan, plan from encroachment. Um, development um, along the crosswind runway departure and um, approach areas. Um, the acknowledgement of the airport specific area plan and the impact of residential area within that area, uh, all are very, very, very important aspects to that northern annexation. Um, when we co-mingle uh, cost-benefit analysis um, in one um, analysis that combines uh, both north and south, I think it gives a um, um, unclear analysis of what each annexation's cost um, and benefits in the future will be. And um, I think it just reinforces my um, feeling, not necessarily feeling, but um, my strong advocation that we look at these as two annexations. They both qualify under the Proposition 400 and their size. Um, they happen to be occurring at the same time. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't be looked at individually because of the distinct differences in what they um, will impact the community in the future. So um, that's why I, I will continue to push for the separation so we can analyze each one and not only while we make the decision on annexation, but as the master plans and the development agreements for each one go forward in the future, that we can monitor um, their appropriate um, development over time so that um, the protection for both the south and the north will be appropriate. So um, I just wanted to make that clear because that's the position I have taken and will continue to take. Thank you. Any other comments from the council before we move on? Yeah, yeah Mayor, I just want to ask the councilman, do you, are you, are you advocating for us voting separately on each annexation? We will be voting right. separately on each annexation at the same time, even though the developer wants them to be decided at the same time, but they are separate uh, votes. They are separate votes? Y yes, let me, let me clarify. The process for annexation, the rezonings, and the other any other ancillary votes is separate. So the, you can't annex two parcels under one annexation ordinance that aren't that aren't adjacent or, or next to each other. So the south parcel will go through or the whichever in, on an agenda, presumably at the same agenda, because that's what the applicants requesting. Um, so you'd go through south parcel annexation. You'd go through South Parcel Master Plan approval, South Parcel rezoning, so if, if there's subdivision platting, and all that, and then you go to North Parcel, and those are those are two separate votes. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to touch on the development agreement, whether there's two or one, because that's kind of for a, a future time. But <coughs> in in all of the discussions we've had with with the applicant, they're they're both contingent upon each other at this point. You know, so in other words, if one fails and one succeeds, if north fails and south succeeds or vice versa, the applicant has the, has the ability at that point to, to pull the whole thing. 
So I understand Councilmember Good's concern about monitoring these, but but and also point to the fact that when Planning and Zoning Commission went through, they had, they looked at South in one meeting, and they looked at North, and the other, so they did look at them separately. This council could do the same thing. You could have, if you decide to go further and do more study sessions, you could focus and drill down into South and then drill down into North in whichever order and focus on those. But, but at this point, it's my understanding of the applicant's position that if one fails and one succeeds, then the applicant pulls the one that w withdraws the one that, that succeeds and the deal's off. So that's a, that's a, it, it's a, it's a leveraging or a, or a negotiation point that, that we're going to have to deal with in, as a reality. Thank you. And it's probably relevant here since we're talking about the development agreement and uh, negotiating uh, for the public to know that uh, this council has designated three council members to negotiate on behalf of the full council. And uh, those three members uh, would comprise of uh, Ms. Rusin, uh, Ms. Scholl, and myself. So those three have been designated as the negotiating team which can consider uh, Councilman Good's uh, thoughts in regard to the development agreement. And I hope to have that negotiation start uh, in December, we'll see. Uh, we had a meeting that uh, unfortunately didn't come together tomorrow, but uh, in the very near future, uh, I would expect that team to get with the applicant. We still have not seen uh, any draft back from the applicant. Uh, we've been saying this, and it's still true, unfortunately. Uh, that we have not received a draft development agreement back from the applicant. So that's kind of the process. We'll start with uh, that team negotiating, bringing it back to the council, the full council. Uh, and then once there is a meeting of the minds uh, with the full council, then we would go to uh, the public with that uh, development agreement. It seems like that would make the most sense to have uh, the council have the opportunity to negotiate it uh, before uh, we put it out uh, because otherwise what you might see today is going to be different after the negotiating team and the full council get to take a look at it. So uh, I would imagine this will get pushed into 2021. I'd hoped that we would uh, be able to get to it this year, but it, we're running out of time here and, and we have not seen the development agreement. So um, we will keep uh, moving forward as we can and there's no real uh, tight timeline on this. It's just a matter of doing it the right the right way. Uh, can we move on to cost-benefit analysis at this point? Mayor and Council, uh, as you know, a cost-benefit analysis is an important component of looking at annexations of this size, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sarah Murley of Applied Economics, who has compiled and will be presenting the, the cost-benefit analysis for you this morning. Thank you, good morning. Oops, a little shorter than George. <laughs> Thank you and good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I wanted to walk you through the, the steps um, as far as the cost benefit and fiscal impact analysis. Um, and uh, we are analyzing them in, in combination here. That was the, um, the, the direction um, of our scope. So, the land uses are really fundamental to the results, and we have done our best to um, probe the developer for additional information where there wasn't clarity on the land use plans that were part of their previous submittal in terms of exactly how these different um, pieces might be used. And so, um, and, and the developers, you know, we reviewed the assumptions and. Um, made some changes along the way, and so I believe that at this time, based on what's known at this time, that this is the best representation of how these uses might break out. Um, so, of course, there's the resort hotel, which is a, a low-density, eco-friendly concept with approximately 200 casita-type units. Um, industrial, that's about 91 acres. Uh, 38 acres of industrial transition, which the developer envisions being used for mini storage and RV storage. Um, the 156 acres of general industrial uses, which there's no specific information, but um, we're just assuming sort of normal industrial similar to other 
um, industrial areas around the airport. Uh, as Bryn mentioned, there is about 20 acres of municipal civic use designated. Um, in conversations with public safety, we don't anticipate that would be used for a police or fire station. Um, so for the purpose of our analysis, we have assumed a, a charter school on that site. Um, 571 acres of single family with somewhat different densities in the north and the south. Um, that includes area in the south plus um, there's an area in the north that is totaling 503 acres, of which 88 acres is anticipated for manufactured housing, and the remainder is put into that 571 acres that you see up there. Um, and then the 80 acres of multifamily at the top of the AED south area. And then um, a variety of different types of vacant or open space. So there's the airport impact area, uh, the end of the runway totaling about 399 acres. There's no development anticipated for that area. Um, the Point of Rocks Preserve, about 475 acres that would be um, dedicated or deeded to the city for future maintenance. And then 503 acres of other open space um, throughout these, these areas. <coughs> we looked at a 25 year um, time frame, which is traditionally what we have used for um, these types of cost-benefit analyses, starting with some infrastructure development in 2022 and extending through 2046. So the next step was to look at projected absorption because we're doing impacts on an annual basis. So the timing of different types of development is important. Um, the developer provided some timelines beginning and end times for each of the different components of development in, in more detail than what is shown here. There's more detail on absorption in the actual report um, that you have. And um, then we work with the planning division to sort of refine the timing within those, um, you know, the speed of development within those time periods, um, generally following sort of a, a bell curve of ramping up and ramping down. And um, so in general, looking at the residential development between 2023 and 2037, with the south area potentially building out a little bit ahead of the north area, um, the south area maybe 2036 is the assumption we're using, 2037 in the north area for single family. For the manufactured housing, potentially uh, that's a smaller area and a fairly defined use. So. Um, potentially build out in 2032 for that, and then the multifamily building out in 2029. So looking at what the um, socioeconomic impacts of that mix of uses would be, we're projecting a total of about 4,400 new residents. We are assuming for the single family development that approximately 8% of those units would be held for seasonal use, which is consistent with um, the citywide percentage of housing inventory that is held for seasonal use based on information from the census. And so we're not assuming new residents would come out of those units. And that matters primarily for um, state shared revenues that are allocated to the city on a per capita basis based on residents. Um, the employment uses are generally fairly low density with the um, general industrial and the industrial transition being used primarily for sort of storage uses. Um, so we're only um, projecting about 600 and employment of about 630 um, jobs at build out from this area. In terms of capital improvements, um, there are no improvements that um, would be anticipated that the city would fund. However, there is additional infrastructure that would be maintained by the city and we're capturing those maintenance costs in our impacts. So we're estimating based on um, information from Public Works, uh, 48 lane miles um, of new roads, including um, two miles of Granite Dells Parkway in the south and then five miles of combination of Granite Dells Parkway plus the primary north-south um, arterial through that southern part of the development, and then an, another eight miles of residential 
um, streets and collectors in the south area. And then in the north area, about nine lane miles of arterials plus um, 24 lane miles of residential streets. And so those are added incrementally along the residential part, along with the residential development, the arterials added ahead of development, um, since those obviously have to be in place to have access to both the non-residential and residential areas. Um, the developer is also anticipating three acres of developed parks that would be uh, maintained by the city, so we're capturing maintenance costs for that. And then for the Point of Rocks Preserve, we are anticipating $75 per acre per year for um, general maintenance that the city would need to do on that, um, that particular preserve open space. Uh, the, in terms of the fiscal impacts, we included the general fund, um, the water and wastewater operating funds, the streets fund, and then also, I apologize, it's omitted here, but the transient occupancy tax fund since we have specifically resort development in this area. Um, we look at revenues and expenditures from current and past budgets and look at you know patterns by line item and develop um, rates and uh, methodology for modeling each line item. In most cases, the um, revenues are based on, in many cases, they're based on population and employment, but also specifically for property tax, for example, we're, we're estimating assessed value. Um, for the resort, there's taxable sales. Um, there's also um, taxes on leases, which could be, which are, we're assuming is from part of the industrial space, but also on the multifamily leases. There is lease revenue from the um, storage, the RV storage and the mini storage in the residential transition area. And there are also lease revenues on the slab rentals for the manufactured housing. Um, for expenditures, those are based in, on a combination of um, population and employment for more general things, but for infrastructure maintenance, um, you know, we're looking at the street lane miles, the public park acres, um, the level of water and wastewater use to um, estimate those expenditure line items. So um, we develop rates for, e for each line item that we apply to the land use assumptions for the development. So this table is a little bit small, although um, it is also in the report just showing the summary of annual impacts for each one of the funds. You can see that the overall net impact um, for the 25 year period for all funds combined is about $14.95, $15 million or a uh, net present value of 12 million. Um, each of the funds individually does have a positive net impact, although there are some um, negative annual impacts in the streets fund, and so we'll talk in a little more detail about that. In the general fund, um, the primary revenues are sales tax and state shared revenues. Um, the sales tax from construction in particular um, is significant in the early years, particularly in 2024 through 2029 when the most um, development is happening. The resort, we're assuming, would come online in 2026, although you don't see a big bump up in that year because there's so much construction activity also going on during that time, but um, obviously that's a permanent addition to sales tax revenues. And then um, state shared revenues sort of gradually increase as residential development progresses out through 2038. And, and I will clarify, and I'm, I apologize, I meant to say this earlier, that although we are looking at a 25-year time horizon, we are assuming that the development could be built out by 2037, 2038. So the years beyond that are um, reflecting a build-out level of development. In terms of expenditures in the general fund, police and fire are, of course, the largest expenditures, um, particularly with that size of resident population. We're assuming um, annual expenditures about 2.3 million for police and fire combined by 2046. <laughs> um, depending on the capacity available in existing stations in the early years, that could be um, less in those years, but at build out, um, certainly additional capacity would be needed. Um, the only other sizable um, but much smaller expenditure light on, line item would be for recreation. And so we're assuming about $120,000 in recreation expenditures relating to this new population. 
The water fund and the wastewater fund both show um, fairly small positive net impacts throughout the period. There are no capital improvements included here, which um, for this particular development, but um, we're looking at, uh, and we're not including water-related impact fees as a revenue source in the water fund, but we are looking at water usage charges. Um, we're estimating the level of usage gallons per acre for the different kinds of development and um, looking at the um, current water fee schedule and applying that to projected usage levels. And then for expenditures, um, looking at the cost for different per account for different kind of accounts, we were able to use the 2019 um, water and wastewater study that Raftelis Consulting performed for the city that had a lot of good statistics about um, revenues and cost for different types of water and wastewater users. Similarly, for the wastewater um, revenues, we estimated the um, gallonage for the different kinds of uses and um, expenditures are based on the number of connections by type. In the streets fund, uh, the primary revenues are from highway user revenue funds, which are distributed to the city based on population. And so those would obviously increase as the residential development in this area increased. There is also sales tax that currently goes to the streets fund, although that um, sunsets in 2035, hence the negative annual impacts, um, because there is maintenance costs for the 48 estimated lane miles of additional streets and the um, HERF revenues, the Highway User Revenue Fund revenues are not sufficient to fully cover those expenditures. And then um, finally, in the transient occupancy tax fund, the annual bed tax revenues um, with inflation are estimated about $671,000 a year by 2046. And those revenues are um, primarily used to support tourism and recreation. So, um, you know, positive overall net impact, but obviously uh, some minor issues with regard to street maintenance. And then, um, I already covered this, but um, then to close, the other thing that we look at is non-quantifiable impacts, so things that we can't fully capture in the analysis of city revenues and expenditures. Um, certainly in the north area, it's important for the city to protect the airport from encroachment and allow for um, any future runway expansion that might be needed. And so that whole airport impact area that is vacant around the north side of the runway and the northeast side of the runway um, is important to be able to, for the city to have control over that. Um, then uh, also in the area of its topic of open space, being able to have that point of rocks preserve um, and the adjacent land and trails for people to use for recreational uses um, is certainly a benefit. Um, this development does include industrial sites that support economic development, although it's certainly not the only industrial area available around the airport. Um, there is a mix of housing and some higher density lower priced housing and some multifamily housing that could potentially um, provide workforce housing in the future for those industrial jobs around the airport. And then um, finally, the unique um, eco-friendly resort concept that is proposed for this area that would bring uh, additional visitors to um, Prescott that you know could spend money outside of the resort. So um, that concludes my presentation, but I am happy to answer questions that you may have. Go ahead, Mark. Mark. Before, thank you for this. I appreciate it. Um, I think this is a very interesting slide because it, with this specific project, in my mind, some of the hard to quantify positive impacts are the most dramatic of the project in its totality. Is there a way that we could see an addendum, or if we were so desirous of having one, that made some assumptions about Park and preserve visitation and direct and direct and indirect economic impact, because I think that that would be very valuable information, not just for the council but for the community. I don't know how the rest of you feel about that, but because the project centers so much on the 474 acres, I think it would be very interesting to know what that actually looks like if we can make some visitation assumptions. 
is that something we could do? That is certainly possible. Um, you know, there are assumptions that there's an Office of Tourism has for visitors spending in Yavapai County. Um, we might need to modify those. Some the the um, challenge, I guess, is to determine what share of people who use the trails already live in the city sure. versus people who are attracted to those trails and come specifically to Prescott for that reason. And so we could certainly do some research and see what is available. Um, I just think the size and the scope of this preserve will make it a destination and there could be some additional visitation impacts that probably a, a localized park wouldn't have. Uh, certainly a regional park, Michael, to your point, I think it is going to be a big draw in the state and probably even outside of the state. So um, it would be nice to make sure we're fully quantifying the ecotourism that will happen as a result of this regional park. Yeah, we can talk offline about it. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments here on the cost-benefit analysis? Uh, Councilman Good. Thank you. Um, with the uh, projection of all these additional um, housing units and occupancy of those housing units. Um, I didn't really see a projection of how uh, commercial retail services would develop uh, adjacent to these annexation areas that would gen uh, um, generate sales tax, TPT sales that would benefit the city. Have you considered that at all? That is certainly um, something that we could consider, but we have limited our analysis to what is specifically within the annexation area. Um, there will be purchases obviously made outside of that area because there is not regular you know, neighborhood retail within that area. Um, but for each, in, based on what we have done in the past for each annexation area, we have only considered the uses within that area. Uh, I'm curious uh, that you projected water use by gallons per acre per day. That's um, generally not a statistic that we monitor very closely. Uh, what was the justification for that? Um, I had data in the Raftelis study that I was able to use um, for different, for the residential I had unit counts, so actually I could be more specific there. For industrial, it's very hard to say right. what exactly the users will be, and so we had to use some per acre um, numbers for that. But um, actually, for the residential, um, we have specific information since we are estimating the number of units, and obviously the usage is different for a multifamily unit, for example, than for a single per family. Gallons unit. per person per day? Um, per unit. Yeah. And any assumptions on um, how um, modern fixtures and uh, many of our conservation um, efforts to make sure people are using low um, water use appliances and fixtures and and uh, our plant palette and those kinds of things, are they included in that? I used projections from the Raftella study and I, um, I I'm not able to say with certainty exactly what their assumptions are as far as um, modern low water use fixtures. So that uh, water fund uh, estimate could be uh, pretty dramatically plus or minus. Yes, but I would say that the revenues and expenditures to some extent move in tandem. So um, more water is used, more fees are collected, and there is more cost to provide that water. Thank you. Councilmember Rusing. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, very comprehensive. I uh, I have a few uh, questions uh, back to the street maintenance element. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned 48 uh, lane miles total, and then I got the north uh, annexation has 20 lane miles residential. Do you uh, have that number of how many Sorry. residential? Lane in the north area? South. Oh, south, okay. Uh, eight. Eight. And um, one of my questions is, um, do you feel that if um, those streets weren't publicly maintained, if they were um, private, we have some subdivisions that are privately maintained, the lots are, have an assessment, do you feel that would be uh, a positive impact on your cost-benefit analysis? 
It would certainly reduce expenditures in public works for street maintenance if there, if some of those were private streets. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the council? I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for coming up. We appreciate that. So what I'm getting bottom line from this summer of, summary of annual net impacts is that revenues over expenses will be a positive $14,952,865 over the lifetime of the um, project? Over 25 years. Yes. So, you know, things will continue after that, but we just looked at a 25-year time horizon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Seeing... Oh, John. I actually have a question. <clears throat> um, when you looked at the general fund benefits... Um, you know, we see now the trend is, is online purchasing mm -hmm. and, the, and the city earns now, or I guess, I don't know if earns is the right word, but gets mm -hmm. sales tax from online purchases based on zip code. Is that, you know, if you add those folks into the residential in the north, residential in the south, and then they do online purchasing, which obviously is the trend, is that, was that calculated into your general fund calculation? It was not, but that is a good point with, um, you know, the change in the way for change. And so, um, in that way, the house becomes the point of sale, effectively. And um, I will tell you, you know, I think during this COVID period that online purchasing has certainly gone up. Um, prior to that, people actually purchased about 8 to 12 percent of their total retail spending was in online purchases and very focused in certain categories like clothing. Um, but um, perhaps permanently, perhaps temporarily, we don't really know yet, um, that has increased. And I did not allocate um, those sales tax. This is, I guess, sort of a worst case scenario because I'm not allocating any sales tax um, related to resident spending. But um, that could potentially change the picture, yes. So I guess the, then the follow-up question would be, um, annexation versus not annexing, if you have the equivalent number of homes that go into the county, the city would effectively lose that online sales tax revenue mm -hmm. if the if a development were to occur in in, a, in the county or a different jurisdiction. That's a that's a loss essentially against it. Right. True. Well, and it would occur to me that it's probably well north of twelve percent at this point in terms of the household spending online. I, you know, I, we we support our local businesses here in town, yet folks are really. Uh, in tune to using Amazon and others online. So uh, I don't know what that number would be, but it's well north of 12%. Uh, Mayor, I did a little napkin math about population. Would you like me to share it or just keep it to myself? No, go ahead. Okay. Don't hold me to it, but, you know. So um, the assumption is the build-out by 2027, which is a 17-year build-out. 2037. But, but you were looking at 20, a 17-year as a potential, right? As the wor worst case scenario of rapid growth. I thought I saw that statistic in there. Um, we are generally, we have um, most of the uses other than the resort um, and the multifamily building out in around 2037. Okay, so it's, a, well, forget my math then because it's gonna sound good. But I, what, I, what I was saying is over a 17-year period of time, and now it's actually a 27-year period of time, it's 4,400 residents, plus or minus. Um, when I was looking at it a 17-year period of time, you were looking at, if you did straight-line population growth, which isn't what she had, but just assume it, it was six-tenths of 1% of growth per year. So if you did it over another 10 period of time, it's significantly less than six-tenths of 1% population growth over a 27 year period of time, 30 year period of time. Six tenths of 1% annual. I was assuming a 2027, so I was off by 10 years. Sounds like runaway growth to me. Yeah. Um, and then it's aggregate population growth of, if you assume that our residency for right now is about 44,000, easy math, it's 10% over a 27 year period of time, so you take the 10% growth, and if you did it straight line, it's really significantly less than 1% per year, specifically for this project. 
which I think is f important for people to understand when they think this is a rapid expansion of the population of this community. Fair enough, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, th thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanna point out the, um, the resort and the uh, transient occupancy tax, the bed tax, basically. Uh, I sit on the um, Tourism Advisory Committee, and I can tell you we do great things with that money. Uh, not only do we promote tourism, we also promote nonprofits within our community that bring tourists in there. So I, I think this is, it's hard to put a dollar amount on what all of that does, but this would be a destination place for people to come, not only because of the jails and whatever's going on in that whole open space area, but the quality of what this will be will bring great um, opportunities, I think, to our city through the through the bed tax. So I just wanted to point that out because people that have heads in beds also eat, <laughs> they buy. There's a lot that's gonna go on as a resu result of this resort. So it's really a tremendous benefit in my mind. So I just wanted to point that out. Certainly be a destination resort. Can I, can I have a comment? Yep. Let me ask you this. People keep talking about commercial. Do you agree that you can't just pull commercial out of the air and that's the reason why it's tough to really project what the impact of commercial may be? <coughs> so you're talking, I'm sorry to clarify, uh, commercial development that could be supported outside of this annexation area by the people that live in this annexation area? Yes, well, commercial development within this annexation area that, that is, is zoned commercial but that doesn't mean that ultimately, I mean, the market is going to determine that, not just because we've zoned it commercial. Uh, certainly, uh, retail development is, is market-driven and, um, you know, will proceed along with residential development. And it is, um, you know, it, you can certainly help it along, but you, you can't, Specifically, it's market driven. You can, there's only so much you can do to influence that. Um, with regard to the residential units, it's um, somewhat difficult. We can estimate based on the estimated housing values and what the implied income of these people would be, how much they could have the capacity to spend. But whether they would spend that in the city of Prescott or in Prescott Valley or on Amazon or somewhere else is a very difficult distinction to make. Thank you. Councilmember Roosing. Thank you. I'd just like to make a few observations on our, uh, our growth. Um, as you know, Arizona real estate's either a boom or bust, and so it's kind of hard to predict an, an even, reasonable uh, rate of growth. But, you know, not only do we have the AED uh, development, we also have Granite Dells Estates, we have Deepwell Ranch, and these developments are a new model for our community. We um, have our, are having fewer custom lots. Uh, these are mass-produced, mass-graded uh, developments that g seem like they go in uh, overnight. We're approving phases in the hundreds now. And so to just uh, limit our growth to um, just these 4,400 new homes, um, you gotta look at the big picture because we have many other thousands of homes coming online from these other and future developments. Council Member Rusing, I think that's a good point. And I actually looked from 2010 to 2020, the community's grown about 4,400 people. So the growth rate has been um, about 10.7% over a census 10 year period of time. At the same time, Yavapai County grew by 13.4%, and so did the state. So our growth rate over the past 10 years is significantly less than the region, PV, and the state of Arizona. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilwoman Rosine, did you have another comment? No, thanks. Thank you. I, I would like to comment on that and I pushed my marker before the mayor left. And so Alexa, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and then we can have Alexa. Uh, a, a big part of our general plan speaks to affordable housing. Custom homes are not necessarily affordable to a lot of people that want to move and live and work and play in the city of Prescott. So 
uh, you know, I've been paying attention to house prices. And even even those that I think you call them mass produced or whatever, uh, even those homes are very nice homes, uh, bringing lots of nice people to our area. And, uh, and they're much more affordable than the custom homes. And, and so I think we just have to have an awareness of the multiple housing. And we need people that teach our kids, that work in our hospitals, that work in our city, have the opportunity to live in our city. So I, I think it's really important that we do as much as we can to bring the cost of housing down. You can't do that if you have two acre lots in our city and custom homes. So I, I just have to make that point. It seems to me, I, I've, I've written it down here several times about there's this feeling of kind of an elitism that everybody has to be at this high level of living. And my, we don't want some of these other people next to us. And I just think that is, uh, I just can't be quiet on that anymore. This is part of our general plan to do what we can to put some affordable housing so people that live here, that work here can also live here. Maybe it looks like an apartment, maybe it looks like a smaller home, uh, but we need to make that as much as we can to facilitate that. So, Sorry to be so <laughs> emphatic about this, but I think it's really important for Prescott. Uh, Councilwoman Scholl. Thanks, Mayor. I was, I was just gonna allude to the same thing. I appreciate you know, wanting to keep an eye on our growth and development and be mindful of that, but I, I just am frustrated by this sentiment that we only want custom homes in our community. As a young person, as someone who was very lucky to be able to find my town home and own it that I live in, it was literally by the grace of God that that happened. Otherwise, I would not be able to find a place to live in this place and I and and that's just frustrating as a young person as someone who is hopeful to establish a family here we can't expect young people to want to stay here and afford to stay here when a starter home is five hundred thousand dollars or more mm -hmm. that's unrealistic so I, I think it's just important to keep that in mind when we're looking at the development patterns of our community we have to be mindful of the long-term longevity of our community, and that requires an active and healthy workforce. So. Councilman Blair. I once lived in a mobile home, <laughs> and it was a nice home. And, and I will go back to tell you as a part of history, our past uh, mayor, Sam Steiger, tried to paint this community RA35 back in the day when he was mayor and it failed miserably. Our general plan does not call out large lots in this community. If you'll look down Mount Vernon or, or you look down Pleasant Street, they're all on 50 by 150 lots. They just happen to be historic at this point in time. But there were small houses built on small lots. And I look at Pine Lakes out in the county as being a pad-associated RV modular community. And you can't find something any better than that with widowed folks that live there, with young families that live there, all kinds of folks that live there. Even though it's at 55 and older, there's some younger kids that are renting in there. We have to have a mix of employment. Uh, otherwise, we don't survive. And that's why Prescott's always survived when a downturn of the economy happens, because you have a mix of every type of people that live in your community, not just the elite. Uh, Councilman Sishka. Thank you, Mayor. Just an aside, you know, we always talk about being concerned about water consumption. Well, it's been stated on both sides of the issue. Yes, density is the most efficient use of water. Okay? So that's all I had to say. All right, um, we only have about 30 some odd minutes left here. And oh, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. Um, and Sarah, I'm wondering, you know, we only have a couple of folks here uh, in the chambers. What do you have online? I have received three public comment cards from uh, people in chambers, and I have two members of the public in the Zoom call that are raising their okay. hands at the moment. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to give the applicant 
uh, just a couple minutes here. I believe Jason Giese is on Zoom. And uh, if you would want to make a few comments before we go to public comment. Yep. Mr. Giese, I'm going to um, allow you to talk if you want to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We sure can. Go right ahead. Good morning, uh, all. I'm uh, in quarantine. So the reason that the meeting is canceled tomorrow is because of me. Um, hopefully by Thanksgiving, I will be uh, done with Corona and uh, we can get back to business. So I apologize for the inconvenience, but uh, it is what it is at this point. Um, my comments are real simple and I'll make it quick. Um, the, the comments here this morning thus far um, really, as George read through the public comment that has been received over the last 60 days, are, are very consistent with the comments that we had at planning and zoning. So not, nothing new or um, unexpected from, from my perspective as we push forward. Um, I, think, I think the one thing that I'd like to address directly would be Councilman Good's comment on two different uh, annexations. Um, it's true that John Palladini, John Palladini has, has painted the picture properly that we have, we've tied these two annexations together. Um, and and that, that's been the strategy that we've had uh, for a couple of years now. Um, the mayor made a comment that at, at this point, it's about getting, getting things done properly or correctly. And so at the point that I'm, I'm healthy and free to move about the cabin again, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'd say that we're not opposed to looking at the potential to separate uh, the annexations. I, I would ask the negotiating committee to, to come forward with, with a proposal or suggest, suggestions for how that might, might work. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not something that's, it's not a no, um, that, that we wouldn't consider it. Um, we'd, we'd look at it. I don't know how that would, how that would look. That's why I'm, I'm hesitant here. Um, but certainly open to discussing it with the negotiating committee, um, when, when we can get, get down to that level, uh, last comment, and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Cause I know you have other folks that would like to speak today, um, as it relates to development agreement. Um, the development agreement is a, a very detailed document that has to stand the test of time. The development agreement runs with the land. It, it is a, whether, whether we own this property or three owners down the road, folks own this property, the, the property will always be subject to the development agreement. So no different than getting the annexations right, the development agreement has to be a document that that is right so that um, in, in the future, as I work through the actual platting of the subdivisions, there is, there is an absolute guideline for the parties to, to follow. Um, that, that's a concept that I'm very comfortable with. As you all know, we've not asked to be um, excused from the land development code of the city of Prescott. We haven't tried to write our own code. We're, we're comfortable with the city's code. We're comfortable with water consumption um, regulation in the city of Prescott. And, and that development agreement is, is the document that will bind us and future councils um, so, so that it can be, be checked against, you know, is this phase as proposed by AED consistent with the development agreement and, and the, the planned area development um, that that's a comforting uh, fact for for us on the private side, as well as the staff and the the elected representatives of the city of Prescott, so that we have that north star, the guideline, the contract um, that that dictates our behavior into the future. So that's a long way of me saying we've spent a lot of time, a, a, a ton of hours on getting. The development agreement put together in a detailed and organized fashion so that it is a very useful document and a user-friendly document into the future um, to, to prevent 
uh, fighting misunderstandings, problems um, that that I know from experience in my career um, can can easily crop up. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, the council may have for me. All right, thank you, Mr. Gisi, uh, Councilman Blair. Uh, Mr. Gizzi, just a comment. I would never intend to hold your feet to the fire because that's not how I work. But is there some kind of idea when you might have this prepared document to come back to the city so that we can look at it? Yeah, so so Councilman Blair, the, the game plan was simply to meet tomorrow on Wednesday um, with the document and present it to the negotiating committee first um, be, because I tested positive for COVID yesterday. That that plan got shot, got blown up. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I think it's best that we, we meet and discuss and walk through um, the development agreement with the negotiating committee on the first time around to, to uh, make sure questions are answered and understanding and rationale for why it's put together the way it's put together is, is understood between the parties. And so I, I would say that the week after Thanksgiving, uh, as long as I get a negative test when I'm done with quarantine, um, we, we would sit down and go through that process. I, pre uh, I appreciate that, Jason. And I, and I will tell you, people are listening to you. They'll know what the laid out format of that is now that we have a team that's going to meet with you. And certainly we wish you a speedy recovery. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, comments for Mr. Giese from the council? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Giese, for your comments. Appreciate it. I just muted. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Sarah, I think uh, given that you have just a handful, five or six different comments online and here in the room, uh, let's recalibrate and do three minutes per speaker. Uh, I had anticipated a lot more people, so that's why we had done the two minutes. But yeah, let's go ahead uh, with uh, maybe in chambers first and then your Zoom and we'll do three minutes per speaker. Okay, we've got it. The first card I have is Tom Rusing. Uh, good morning and thank you. I will say I did have prepared comments and have had to be modified slightly by the things I've heard, so bear with me as I work through this. Uh, I think you all know me. I'm Dr. Tom Rusing, Vice Chairman now of Save the Dells and a longtime resident of Prescott, uh, 2194 Forest Mountain Road. My comments and those that follows reflect the analysis and opinions of the leadership of Save the Dells regarding the proposed Arizona Equal Development South Annexation. I request that my comments be entered into the minutes of this meeting uh, verbatim. <clears throat> While I'm encouraged by some of the comments made uh, earlier today, the majority of my comments, I think, are still pertinent. An informed citizenry is critical to the function of our city and our democracy. There are many citizens who feel the process by which the 60-day public comment period has been handled has been flawed, and it diminishes the importance of having adequate information during that time period mandated by Prop 400. To omit the uh, draft uh, development agreement in the planning and zoning proceedings was unacceptable. Commissioners stated publicly that they were, that they were, was inadequate information to make an informed recommendation. It is critical that citizens have adequate information and time to analyze uh, the details of this complicated uh, development agreement and not the minimum. And I'm encouraged uh, that the council has said that they will try to accommodate that. Once an agreement nears its final form, however, it is much harder to change. This process lacks transparency and erodes public trust in our city's leadership. I was encouraged by, or Mr. Giese himself alluded to the importance of the development agreement and also the complexity, and therefore adequate time needs to be provided to the citizens once that's released for them to make a careful analysis and comments to that. I will say that Save the Dells has been very disappointed to have been left out of the crafting of the development agreement. Our representatives met with city officials numerous times over many months and were assured that we would be included in the process as the DA was developed, and that did not happen. It seems strange to us that city officials ask us to the negotiating table, sincerely work with us to come up with a compromise, and then completely let us out while developing the uh, development agreement. <clears throat> it's very unfortunate that this has not happened. 
I was also encouraged by comments made by the mayor and council members about the multiple benefits of a regional park and preserve, uh, which Save the Dallas has been pushing for since the beginning. The benefits of health, recreation, economy, and preservation of our unique natural environment. And we look forward to working with the city to make this a reality. Save the Dells is ready to continue to help negotiate a win-win uh, win solution regarding AED's annexation that will satisfy the needs of the city, Prescott citizens, and AED. And while the time limit of two minutes was just in, uh, increased, I will say in general that a two-minute allotment for public comment is inadequate on an issue as important and as controversial as this. The city should embrace the concept of providing more information to the public and giving more time for meaningful input. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Roy Smith. Thank you. My name is Roy Smith. I live at 1939 Rocky Dells Drive in Prescott. I'm going to continue from where Tom left off, and I like the, what I have to say in, included in the minutes of this meeting. Uh, regarding the development agreement, since it is not publicly available, we can only make comments as to what it needs to include. One, the letter of intent must be followed. <clears throat> the letter of intent was carefully negotiated by the city, Save the Dells and AED, and it was stated over and over again publicly that the development agreement would closely adhere to the letter of intent. The 475 acres of natural open space in the heart of the Granite Dells must be deeded over to the city of Prescott concurrently with the approval of the annexation with no possible lapse that could jeopardize its transfer to the public. Area K and L must be a resort or remain natural open space. The resort should be an environmentally friendly eco-resort that blends with the surrounding environment. There will be no increased density in the southern annexation and no transfer of water allocation from the north to the south annexation. That's actually number four. Number five, I keep forgetting to enumerate here. The southern border of Area 8 should be moved north to protect the Native American archaeological site. Homes in this area will be significantly degrade the experience of those using the trail has has occurred in other parts of the trail. Six, the 11 acres that flank Highway 8 to 9 should not be included in the open space calculation as they are not slated for annexation and would offset the recommendation in comment five above by trading one for the other. Seven, AED's water claims to 375 acre feet in Watson Lake must be transferred to the city concurrently with the annexation. Finally, the city of Prescott needs to listen to citizens and experts in the community, including Citizens Water Advisory Group at CWAG and Save the Dells to problem solve and come up with a solution to provide city water and sewer to Section 33 without providing water to large areas of county and state land north of Prescott. Providing water to county lands across the board is obviously controversial and undermines negotiations with AED. We suggest that the city reconsider a constrained water service area as opposed to the vast area in the currently proposed modification to the policy to provide water outside the city limits. Finally, city leadership has an opportunity to do the right thing by putting the interests of people of Prescott first and following through with the efforts that have resulted in the letter of intent. The citizens of Prescott are very concerned and interested in this annexation and are following the process closely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt Lavore. All right, I am going to allow Russell Pilcher to speak. <coughs> you can unmute yourself, Mr. Pilcher. Mr. 
Mr. Pilcher, if you'd like to speak still, please unmute yourself. Well, that's too bad. I had a wonderful uh, opening there, so I'm sorry you missed it. Um, the city website under AED annexation agreement next steps specifically states in bullet number one, the required 60 day comment period ends on November 14th. Now, if that's not true, that has been stated multiple times through this session so far, why not change that statement or elaborate so that citizens know the comment period actually has not effectively ended at all? Uh, to me at least, and I'm not of the highest intelligence, but at least perhaps average, it's at least confusing to me. So I, I would suggest you might modify that particular comment on the city website. And finally, my sincere thanks to our police officer and two out of the remaining 10 sitting on the podium for demonstrating leadership, respect, and concern for their fellow citizens by wearing face coverings during this pandemic period. I really appreciate your uh, demonstration of leadership. Thanks for listening to my comments. That's all. Thank you. All right, Leslie Hoy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, Leslie. Leslie, please unmute yourself. I clicked unmute and it, all right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I have two questions, which I hope someone will answer after I ask them. Um, the first one is, what happens if in the development agreement, Mr. Giese decides he doesn't want to pay for capital improvements or specifies other adjustments that would impact the cost benefit analysis. Will the city or the consultant redo the analysis? I mean, not completely, but adjust the analysis before the development agreement goes to council. That's my first question. And my second question is, according to my math, the cost benefit analysis shows that there are, um, it was considered to be 1.7 people per housing unit. Um, the city used to use 2.1 to calculate water use. So I'm wondering um, where, what the calculations are about the 1.7. Thanks. Thank you, Leslie. And you could initiate an email to Bryn or George uh, to get those questions answered. Thank you. That's all we have, Mayor. All right. Uh, I don't see any other public comment. I think we're done with the uh, discussion here, John. Anything else that you can imagine we need no, to? Mayor, just I guess I'll just make a couple of, of points. Very, and I'll, I'll reiterate. Um, and and this is sort of in one of the inherent problems with sort of citizen-driven initiatives is that they they may be well intended, but they're written in such a way that potentially people mis misconstrue them. So the 60 day required comment period is just that, it's a required minimum. Um, it's not like the federal register that has a 60 or 90 day comment period on proposed regulation and that it ends and then it's the public, the public has no further ability to comment. The city's never worked that way. Uh, I think this council and other councils since I've been here have been very accommodating in terms of taking public comment and having as many uh, study sessions as necessary before an item goes to a vote. And so that will, I, I, I'm confident that will continue on. Um, and I will just reiterate again that the letter of intent, um, the 475 acres on the South Parcel includes the 11. So if there's a desire or a demand that the development agreement mirror the letter of intent, the 475 is the 475. And to sort of, sort of argue that, well, the 11 shouldn't include and there should be another 11 added is the opposite of the development agreement mirroring the letter of intent. So you can't have it all. Um, you can't have everything. You know, you have to sort of be able to compromise and work and negotiate a deal. And the letter of intent was negotiated. The 475 was very publicly shown on the maps and discussed. 
as including that 11 acres. So um, unless Mr. Key, unless through this negotiation process, um, AED, the applicant, wants to add additional land to the open space to quote unquote make up for the 11 acres, I think at that point, I would imagine that the city better be prepared to offer something in return for that, that ad. That's, that's normally how these deals work. Fair enough, Councilman Blair. I just, just want to make one clarification or suggest that people understand that the 20 years I've been here, no council has ever turned down an open space purchase in the Dells, never ever. Matter of fact, we're working diligently on a couple of other pieces of property in the Dells as we speak. And collectively, along with other council people in the past, I've worked with the state land department to bring into the fold of the city of Prescott a regional park concept. So none of these things are new, and I just sometimes have taken back to listen to comments made by the public that we're not doing enough. And I take great offense to that. I also know the mission statement of Save the Dells originally was for 500 acres of land only. Now all these other stipulations that I keep hearing about what they want or what they demand sometimes puts me in the back seat as well. Uh, from my standpoint, this is about preserving and making the beauty of this community go forward and not about nit nitpicking stuff to death. So. Um, just had to say that because the bottom line is I hope Save the Dells gets their, their, their land, 11 acres outside the city. Who cares? We're going to get a great piece of property for a trail easement. We have Goldwater Lake that doesn't sit in the city of Prescott. It's in the county and a great asset. So to draw a distinction to whether it's in the city or not is ridiculous. So those are just some of my basic comments. Very good. Uh, if there's nothing else from the council at this time, this meeting is adjourned. Is it downstairs? Are we downstairs? Downstairs. Now?